You may be seated. All right, if you want to open your Bibles in the New Testament to the Gospel of Mark chapter 12, Mark chapter 12, we're going to be picking up in verse 28 this evening, and Lord willing, we'll go through the end of the chapter. Now, the last couple of units in the chapter are fairly brief, and they will serve as an introduction to chapter 13, so it may be that we run out of time before we get there, and if so, then I'll leave those two for next week. But I'd like to get through uh, the two primary units that appear at the end of this chapter of Mark's Gospel, and then go ahead and introduce uh, to you some of what we're going to be looking at in chapter 13 over the next few weeks. Now, as we prepare to read uh, the portion of text that we're going to be looking at tonight, I want to quickly recap where we've been, how we've gotten here, not with regard to the gospel as a whole, but with regard to the section that we are making our way through, a section that began properly at the beginning of chapter 11. So there you saw Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He was hailed and acclaimed as the son of David, as the Messiah who was appointed and anointed by God to be king. He entered into the city, looked around the temple complex, and then withdrew from the city as would be his custom through the first half of Holy Week. The next morning we see him curse a fig tree and then go on into the city where he cleanses the temple courts of the merchants and money changers that have set up shop and are doing commerce there. And then the next day, as he is returning to the city, the disciples observe that the fig tree that was cursed the day before has completely died. It is withered, it is dry, a process that would normally take months or years in the case of a mature tree has happened in a matter of a moment. And this, of course, is a foreshadowing of what Jesus is doing in Jerusalem during this week and what he's going to do in particular in chapter 13. He is going to curse a fruitless religious establishment that is characterized by hypocrisy and lawlessness and whatever Jesus curses dies. Then he goes on into the temple complex, into the city of Jerusalem itself, and he begins engaging with the religious leaders, or maybe we should say they begin engaging him. It appears that Jesus is there for the purpose of teaching those who might be interested in uh, conversing with him at that time, but he can barely do so because of the intrusion of these religious leaders. The chief priests, the scribes, the elders, all representatives of the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin, they come to Jesus in what may have been a formal or informal delegation in order to challenge his teaching authority. By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do these things? Uh, Jesus, having responded to them, at least insofar as he was willing to do so, given their uh, latent dishonesty, uh, he is then confronted by a series of other uh, religious leaders, various sects of the Jews, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, all sending people to ask Jesus questions that were intended to trap him. A question about Roman taxation policies and whether the Jews ought to participate in that economy. A question about the doctrine of the resurrection, which the Sadducees not only denied but even ridiculed, and they tried to discredit Jesus in that way. And yet each, uh, each time Jesus is questioned in this fashion, he extricates himself from the trap. He does so in a way that displays his wisdom, his power, his insight, his essential goodness, and that really leaves egg on the faces of the religious leaders. Now, that brings us then to the text we're going to look at this evening. Let's pick up in verse 28. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that Jesus had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to Jesus, well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength 
And to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. Now I want you to notice in verse 28 the way in which the scribe approaches Jesus. And I want you to pay careful attention to Mark's presentation of this episode. I say that because most readers are probably more familiar with Matthew's account. This conversation is preserved in both Matthew and Mark's Gospels. And in Matthew's account, which is considerably briefer, covering just about six verses, Matthew uh, kind of leaves this man and his motivations and his own spiritual standing rather ambiguous. But Mark gives us a much greater insight into this man's motivation And Jesus' response to him might even be surprising to you if you're not as familiar with Mark's gospel, but you are familiar with the text in Matthew. You probably assume that this scribe, like the Sadducees, like the Pharisees, like the chief priests, that this scribe has come to trap Jesus. After all, isn't he testing him? Well, in one sense, he absolutely is. And Matthew makes that clear. He's testing Jesus. But remember that not every test that is administered by one, by one person to another uh, is administered for the purpose of discrediting or uh, critiquing or exposing Uh, He is inquiring, and in fact it appears very clear in Mark's gospel that he is inquiring sincerely. This scribe was in fact a member of the party of the Pharisees, as most scribes were at that time. Matthew tells us that additional piece of information. And it says in verse 28 that he was observing the interactions that Jesus had with these other groups. Now we don't know how many interactions like this there were. I am assuming that the information we have about them in Matthew and Mark particularly is an abbreviated summary. I I suspect there were multiple challenges like this, multiple questions like this. Maybe there weren't. Maybe we have all of them. But whatever there were, this scribe has been observing the way that Jesus handles himself. He's observed his interaction most recently with the Sadducees, and he perceives not only that Jesus answers adequately, but Mark says he perceives that Jesus answered them well. And I take that not merely as a, as a statement of, uh, of you know, the eloquence of Jesus' expression, but rather that he answers their question in a compelling way, in a faithful manner, that he uses Scripture rightly and uses Scripture to refute the Sadducees. This Pharisaic scribe would assume that the Sadducees are wrong to deny the doctrine of the resurrection. And he's impressed with the way that Jesus handled that interaction. And so he proceeds to ask his own question. And the question is this, which is the first commandment of all? Now this is very obviously not a question about historical sequence. Uh, If you were to ask what is the first commandment historically that God gave to man, you might say, well, probably be fruitful and multiply. Or maybe it was the command to Adam to tend and guard the garden. Or maybe you would define it negatively and say it was not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Maybe you could make an argument for any one of those being the first command historically. But that's not what the scribe is asking about. He's asking a question of priority. The Mosaic Law was organized by the Jewish rabbis into 613 different commands. 613, which sounds like a lot to us until you realize how many laws govern our existence every day. And then you think, wow, it'd be kind of nice to only have 613 laws that you had to worry about keeping. But nonetheless, I digress. This scribe is asking of those 613 laws, which one stands out above all? Which is the first, i.e. the foremost, Or as Matthew preserves the question, which is the greatest? Which commandment of all of these is clearly above all of the rest? Now, I suspect that if someone asked us this kind of a question, some of us might have muffed it a little bit. We might have said there is no commandment that is first above all. There is no great command. They are all God's commandments and therefore they are all of equal importance. That's not what the Bible teaches. Did you know that? Now, they are all God's commandments, sure, and therefore they are all of equal authority. But that does not mean that they are all of equal importance. This is a principle that is often misunderstood. Most often it seems like we discover this deficiency in our thinking, this defect in our understanding with regard to the doctrine of sin. 
Uh, I've had many Christians who say, well, all sins are, are equal in the sight of God. That's not true. That's not what the Bible teaches. Now, all sins are, are sinful, absolutely, of course, yes. And any one sin is more than sufficient to damn your soul to hell apart from the atoning work of Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean that all sins are equal in the sense of their impact or their heinousness or the way in which they offend the holiness of God. There are degrees of sin. There are degrees of grievousness with regard to sin. And the Bible's very explicit about this. We can say that all sin is sinful without saying that all sin is therefore equal. We can say that all of God's commands are authoritative without saying that there is therefore no distinction in terms of importance and priority among the commands of God's law. Jesus says that while all of these commands are the word of God, some of them are foundational and he names not one but two. He says the first command is found in the Shema. This is the most familiar text from the Hebrew Bible, familiar to all of the Jews throughout their history. It is the prayer that uh, Orthodox Jewish males pray at least twice a day, even down to the present day. And in Mark's Gospel, uh, he includes the theological confession that serves as a prologue to the command. Now, in Matthew's Gospel, it's more abbreviated. Again, people uh, uh, overlook this, but we've said it multiple times in our study of Mark's Gospel. People assume because Matthew and Luke are so much longer than Mark, they must have so much more uh, detail in them. But that's not normally the case. Normally, Mark has more detail in his narrative. He just simply includes fewer stories. Matthew and Luke include more material, but they include less detail about most of the stories that they choose to include. And so in Matthew's gospel, Jesus just simply gives the command. You shall love the Lord your God uh, in this all-encompassing, whole-being way that we're going to talk about. But in Mark's gospel, he mentions that Jesus includes the entire Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And therefore, you are to love God. Because God is one, and because there is one God who has made himself known to Israel, therefore you are to believe in him. That's the, the implicit responsibility of that confession. You are to believe in him, and you are to love him. And the command to love God here is not to love him most. It's not to love him more. It is to love him with all. All the heart, all the soul, all the mind, and all the strength with one's entire being. Now, by the way, normally when the words heart or mind are used in Scripture, they have no reference to the physical bodily organs that we associate with those terms. They are, in almost every other passage, synonymous, as a matter of fact. So to, to speak of the heart, to speak of the mind, is to speak of that reasoning portion of man inside man, that volitional aspect of man, that part with which we make decisions. But when these terms are set side by side one another in this way, unless there is some kind of poetic parallelism going on, and that does happen in the Psalms and in Proverbs, uh, ordinarily when they're set side by side like this, there is a distinction being made. And so we might conclude then that heart here has reference more to the emotional life of man. Uh, mind has perhaps more reference to the intellectual or rational side of man. Soul is a word that speaks of the life principle that inhabits both man and animals, although uh, that's not to say that man's life is not distinct from the animals. Obviously, our life is because we're made in the image of God, but, but the idea of a soul is a living creature, not a rock, but a living creature that breathes and moves and uh, exists within the created sphere. And then, of course, with all one's strength is to speak of the use of our body, to speak of the power that we have, the choices that we make, the work that we do. We are to love God with absolutely every aspect of our lives. We are to love Him completely with every part of us, so that the love that we have for God is not merely one responsibility that we have on a list of responsibilities. It is the responsibility. And once you understand that, you can then understand why Jesus refers to this as the first commandment. This is the great commandment. Because every other commandment, in some way, is an expression of this duty. And apart from this duty, no other commandment that you keep could ever have any value at all. 
And then Jesus goes on to describe the second command, which he says is like the first. And here is another mistake that we sometimes make in thinking about this passage. We think that Jesus is is kind of ranking these as if they stand independent of one another, but the duty to love one's neighbor is just slightly less important than the duty to love one's God. That this is not this is not a ranking of independent rules. This is rather a, a sequential, or we might say consequential, relationship from one to the next. When a person understands a responsibility to love God, the next thing that they are to understand is that that necessarily implies a duty to love one's neighbor, because the neighbor is made in the image of God. You are loving God by loving your neighbor in this way. You say, my neighbor is not God. Pastor, you have not met my neighbor. You wouldn't say such things if you had. I'm not saying that your neighbor is God. I'm saying that he is an image of God. I'm saying that he is an image bearer. He is made in the likeness of God. And even though in his personal behavior, he may be nothing like God, he nevertheless, by his very existence, is made in that way. And that's why this is the second command. It's not as though this is one command, and when you fulfill that command, then you move on to number two, as if these are steps in a process. But but the second flows out of the first. How do I love God? I love God by loving the image of God. I love God by loving the representatives of God in this creation, and that is my fellow human beings. Now, the Lord describes this command in the words of Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18. You may notice that the principle is exactly the same as what we call the golden rule. We're familiar with that formulation of it in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. uh, Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. That rule, which by the way, James calls the royal law. That sounds better than golden rule, I think. But anyway, uh, that royal law is exactly the same command. It's exactly the same command. It's just in a different form. But, but we, we need to notice that Jesus is quoting these two commands from the books of Deuteronomy and Leviticus. And if you get to the book of Leviticus in your daily Bible reading plan, that's probably where your daily Bible reading plan like, goes to die. I don't know how many people even make it to Deuteronomy, right? Normally they get, they get stuck and, and, ju- and just fall off the train in Leviticus and Numbers. Uh, but, but Jesus is quoting two of those books that we think to be maybe most difficult or maybe least relevant. That's a terrible mistake, by the way. Terrible mistake. And I'm not trying to shame you about that or guilt you with regard. I want you to see that Jesus is leaning on the Pentateuch in identifying the very foundation and substance of our ethics our responsibilities as people are to be found in the books of Deuteronomy and Leviticus of all places. Then you may say, well, but pastor, they can also be found in the books of Matthew and Mark, and they're a lot more fun to read. There's nothing in there about skin tests for leprosy like there is in Leviticus. But the reality is that it's found in the New Testament because the New Testament writers, including Jesus, are speaking out of the Old Testament. That needs to tell us something about the continuing validity of that law. You say, well, the Mosaic law, it's been abrogated by the work of Christ. Well, yes, in many respects, many important respects, that's true. But here is Jesus who's doing that work, and yet he's still quoting those books. Evidently, he still finds some value in them, and so should we. Now, in verse 32, the scribe replies to Jesus, and he praises him. And unlike the praise of the Pharisees when they came to question him about taxation, you remember that, oh, teacher, we know that you're true, and you don't care anything about man, you just speak the truth, let the consequences be what they will be, but they're they're flattering him in this dishonest way. This scribe is not dishonest. This scribe is being sincere. He says, teacher, you have spoken the truth, this is right, In fact, he goes on to to kind of amplify what Jesus says. He says, there is one God and there is no other but He, and to love Him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. Now listen to what he says. Is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Things you never thought you would hear coming out of a Pharisee's mouth. This man is a Pharisee and a scribe He belongs to the two groups that the Lord most strongly denounces 
And yet clearly not every member of those groups was a hypocrite. This man had true understanding of the Word of God and the will of God. He knew the duty to love God was greater than the duty of sacrifice. He knew that there were no rituals that man could perform. There was nothing that man could offer to God that could in any way uh, substitute for these ideas. This is the first and great commandment. And so what this tells us then is that this scribe asked Jesus a question that he already knew the answer to. He's not looking for information. He's not trying to learn something about the command. He's trying to learn something about Jesus. Now, this immediately seems presumptuous to us, doesn't it? I mean, you've got a scribe that is going to test the intelligence and the understanding of the Messiah. That that sounds just blasphemous on its face. But understand, this scribe doesn't know who Jesus is. And evidently, he's honest enough to want to know. And one of the things that he knows is, if this man is truly a prophet, or if perhaps, as some people are saying, this man is the Messiah, he is going to understand this most basic point of theology, this most basic point of faith. It is a basic point that is missed and misunderstood by many of his fellow Pharisees and scribes. And yet he wants to know, does Jesus understand it? What you see in his response indicates sincerity and honesty, but it also indicates his curiosity. He wants to know how much Jesus knows. And he wants to see if the Lord understands what many of his peers do not understand. And he is he's pleased to see Jesus' response in this way. And then notice what Jesus says in rejoinder. Verse 34, Mark says, Jesus saw that this man answered wisely. Wisely. That's Mark's inspired narrative commentary on this man's question. And again, if you only know this story from Matthew's gospel, you're going to come away with a very different idea about this man. But it's not because of anything that Matthew says. You can go home and set these side by side and read them very carefully. Matthew doesn't say anything negative about this man. He just says a scribe tested him by asking him this question. And that's exactly what he did. But, it, but because you've been conditioned to assume all of the scribes are bad guys, all of the Pharisees are hypocrites, you're just assuming that he's got a bad motive, but he doesn't. This is a wise man. And what does Jesus say to him? You are not far from the kingdom of God. Now think about the implications of that statement for a minute. Do you remember in Mark chapter 10 when we saw the rich young ruler walk away from Jesus, sorrowful because he had many possessions? And yet just prior to that, Mark tells us that when Jesus looked at that young man, he loved him. Jesus doesn't love reprobates. Jesus doesn't look at hypocrites with love. Mark chapter 3 verse 5 says he looks at hypocrites with anger. Remember, Mark tells us a lot about Jesus' emotional life. He tells us a lot about Jesus' attitude in particular circumstances. Jesus is not looking at the rich young ruler and saying, oh, you know, what a godless, idolatrous blasphemer you are, but I just, I, I just think you're so cute. I just think you're so wonderful. I mean, that, that's, that's dumb. That's not what Mark is saying at all. What you're seeing is the love of the Lord for a lost sheep. And sheep are stupid. And sometimes they walk away from the shepherd. And the shepherd has to get his little shepherd's crook and he has to pull their legs out from under them and pick them up and put them where they're supposed to go. I suspect, I won't be dogmatic about this, that you'll be with this scribe in heaven. Because I don't see people coming near to the kingdom of God in this way. Men of honesty, men of wisdom, men of sincerity, coming near to the kingdom of God, but uh, just not quite making it. Just kind of falling a little bit short. This man is on the path. He's on the road. And Jesus acknowledges that. I think we can safely assume that he became a follower of Jesus at some point because his trajectory is clear. Reprobates and hypocrites are never said to be close to the kingdom, even when they are comprehended within the visible kingdom. Even when they are part of the visible church, they're not close to the kingdom of heaven. They're always far away. Now, 
by way of application, before we go to the next part of our study, I want to point something out that I know we've talked about many times before, and so I'll be brief, but it's important to at least underline this lesson here. And that is that this exchange between Jesus and the scribe uh, demonstrates to us the principle of hierarchy within the divine law. And this is an idea that is frequently misunderstood, and we could preach and have, I I don't think I've ever preached it here, but I've preached in other places entire sermons about this idea to make sure that we understand what it means and what it does not mean. The law is not a disconnected set of rules. We're talking about the law of God. It is not a disconnected set of rules. It is not an arbitrary collection or association of guidelines. It is a core principle that is then systematically expounded and applied. The law is one piece. And that is why uh, we would say with regard to Jesus' fulfillment of the law, fulfillment does not mean destruction. It does not mean termination. Yes, Jesus abrogates the ceremonial law of Moses, but what does that even mean? Calvin tells us that the ceremonial law of Moses still applies to us in the sense that there are types and shadows that are pointing us to the work of Jesus. We don't need the whole burnt offering and the peace offering and the sin offering and all of these other sacrifices because we have Jesus. We have the fulfillment of all of those things. But that doesn't mean that suddenly God has decided that he doesn't love worship, that he doesn't love sacrifice, that man can approach God without mediation. No, what the ceremonial law was telling us all the time is that God, or man rather, needs a mediator to approach God. And God demands holiness of his people. The judicial law given to the children of Israel, it applies to a particular nation at a particular time at a particular point in history. But what is the judicial law? It's largely case laws that are drawn out in principal ways out of the moral law of God. The moral law of God, you shall have no other gods before me, you shall not make a graven image, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. What does that look like in the case of historic Israel? There you've got the judicial law. And sure, our circumstances are a little bit different, but the core principles of law that are being worked out there are not different. And the moral law still applies to us today. So it's not as though Jesus is simply picking and choosing from within the law and saying, I like this and I'll keep that. And I don't like this, so I'm going to get rid of that. It's not this disconnected set of rules like people want to imagine. There is a key duty, and that is to love God. That is followed then by a consequent duty, which is to love your neighbor. And the rest of the law unpacks and applies those duties. Every other part of the law is unpacking and applying those duties. And do you know what the teaching of Jesus is unpacking and applying? Do you know what the teaching of the apostles is unpacking and applying? Do you realize that you could get two highlighters, two different colors, and you could mark every imperative in Scripture, both Old and New Testaments, and put it into one of these two boxes? It is either connected to our love for God, or it is connected to the outworking of our love for God, which is love for our neighbor. And so you have two tablets in the Decalogue, the first four commands that apply directly to our relationship to God unmediated, and that, not unmediated in the sense of without Christ, but I mean without interaction with other people. And then the latter six commands, you have the social responsibilities of the Decalogue. You have the ways that you love your neighbor. What does loving my neighbor look like? Um, Honoring your parents, not murdering, not committing adultery not killing, not coveting, not bearing false witness. These are the ways that you love your neighbor. Well, I I need more than that. Okay, well, then we have the casuistic laws. We have the case laws of the the Old Testament, and we have the the exposition of the apostles. But all all of them just come back. I've talked about the Matryoshka doll before, the Russian nesting doll that some of you are familiar with, right? I've got one doll sitting on a shelf in my house. Until you pop her open, and then you realize there's another doll inside, and then you pop her open, and there's another doll inside, and then just all of these interconnected dolls, but they all fit into one bucket. Love God with everything that is within you. Everything in the prophets is about this. Everything in the apostolic writings is about this, right? The law of God is one piece. It is a key duty with a consequent duty that is then expounded and applied throughout the rest of Scripture. All right, let's go to the next part. Verse 35. Then Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, How is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? 
For David himself said, by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore David himself calls him Lord, how is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. Well, we could spend an hour on those three verses by themselves. We're not going to tonight. Several things that you need to see, though, uh, very briefly. Notice that at the end of verse 34, the religious leaders were silenced. After this conversation with the scribe, uh, they don't dare question him anymore. Every one of them has taken their foot and run it into their mouth up to their knee. The chief priests, the scribes, the elders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all of them look foolish, trying to make Jesus look foolish. And they finally just say, okay, that's it. We're done. We're going to have to figure out something else. This is not working. And yet, Jesus piles on. Notice verse 35. Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? Who is he speaking to? He's, he's, he's speaking to the common people, apparently, but he's speaking about the scribes. Why can't these guys explain to you the answer to this question? And notice at the end of the exchange, verse 37, the common people heard him gladly. They're loving this. They, they have seen Jesus flip the tables over. And it's not just the tables of the money changers. It's not just the merchants that are in the temple courts. It is the, the table, the seat of the religious leaders. He's just, he's just come in and just flipped them over. He just flipped over their desks and said, let's, let's have a conversation. You want to test me? That sounds great. Let's have that conversation and then let me test you. And he asks them this question, how can the scribes say that the Christ, the Messiah, is the son of David? Verse 36, for David himself said, and by the way, just as an aside, David himself said by the Holy Spirit, he quotes Psalm 110. Very important text for understanding the doctrine of Scripture. Not only is David the human author of Psalm 110, the Holy Spirit is the one who is putting the words in David's mouth. So you have divine and human authorship. We're not going to unpack all of that tonight, but I need you to at least kind of put a pin there and say, ah, oh, when I'm thinking about what is Scripture, this is one of many passages that I need to think about. And then the quotation, Psalm 110, by the way, uh, is, is probably the, the passage that is most frequently quoted in the New Testament. I don't think there is another one that's quoted more frequently than Psalm 110. It is at least one of the favorite passages for New Testament writers to quote. It's a very, very important messianic psalm. Very important. And so he quotes it. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Now how can David call, how can he speak of the Messiah in this way? How can he call the Messiah Lord while the scribes are saying that the Messiah is David's son? This is an exegetical question. It is unlike the questions that the religious leaders have just recently posed to Jesus. It is not the question about authority, which was a personal question. It is not a politically dangerous question like the question about taxation. It is not a mocking question like the question about the resurrection. It's, it's just a Bible study question. I mean, it's just like very simple. Just how can this passage be reconciled with this theological affirmation? The Christ is David's son, but David calls him Lord. How can we reconcile that? This should have been easy, but it wasn't. Now, you will not understand this question, why it's even a question, and you won't understand the solution unless you first understand three underlying issues. And I need to make those clear to you before we go further. First, there is a linguistic issue. And that linguistic issue relates to the fact that the two words for Lord in verse 1 of Psalm 110 are different Hebrew terms. We'll talk about that in a second. Secondly, there is a theological issue. Psalm 110 is a messianic psalm. All of the Jews understood that. This is not debated. This is not controversial. Everybody knows this is about the Messiah. But then David is referring to Messiah as his Lord, my Lord. That's a reference to the Christ. That's very important for you to understand. And then third, there is a cultural issue to understand. The Jews always viewed one's ancestors as superior. Okay, let me unpack each of those very quickly. Linguistically, even though this text in Mark chapter 12 
is written in Greek, and the conversation was probably in Aramaic. The Old Testament passage that is being quoted was originally in Hebrew. Now, some of your English translations will preserve the distinctive capitalization that you will find in the Old Testament in Psalm 110. The edition of the New King James that I'm reading out of has the first word for Lord, all in capital letters, and the second word for Lord later in the same verse with only the first letter capitalized. Many of your English versions will have the same pattern. If it doesn't, you can turn back in your Old Testament to the book of Psalms, Psalm 110 and verse 1, and all of your English versions there will have the first Lord, all in capital letters, and the second Lord with only the first letter capitalized. And most of you who at least hang out here know that the word Lord, all in capital letters, a few times in the Old Testament, the word God, all in capital letters, signifies the underlying Hebrew name of God, usually pronounced Yahweh or Jehovah. This is the covenant name of God. Every other designation given to God in the Bible is descriptive. It's not a proper name. It's a, it's a description or a title. He is God, the Mighty One. He is Lord and Master. He is the Commander of Hosts that there are many different descriptions of the Lord that are given, but this proper name, the covenant name of God, Yahweh or Jehovah, is his own name. Now, the second word for Lord, with only the first letter capitalized, that is for the Hebrew word Adonai, which just means Lord, Master, Ruler. It's a description of authority. It could be used of uh, uh, you know, a, 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 an earthly authority, it is certainly used frequently of God as the one in authority. Now, at some point, and I am not at all certain that this was true in the first century, but at some point, Jews began refusing to pronounce the name of God. And when they would come to a passage like Psalm 110 that used this name, Yahweh or Jehovah, they would not pronounce Yahweh, they would read instead Adonai. So they wouldn't change the text. But when they would come to that text, when they'd come to those letters, they would just simply pronounce Adonai. And if you hear Jews, by the way, Orthodox Jews, pray the Shema, this is what you will hear, right? If you have ever memorized the Shema in Hebrew and you've used uh, audio to help you memorize those terms, you will hear Adonai when in fact it's, it's Yahweh that is being used there. Adonai is thought to, to be more respectful, right? Because now we're just simply referring to God's authority. We're referring to him by a title. There was a fear that they might take the name of God in vain, that they might use it in a careless way. And this is kind of the hedge around the law. And, and by the way, there's a, there's a long history of, uh, of inquiry into uh, why this tradition developed. And I might share some of that at a later point in time. But, but regardless, they, they, they don't want to pronounce the divine name, lest in doing so they become guilty of sin. And so they decide we won't even speak the name of God. We will simply refer to his title. But you need to know the difference. I personally wish that English Bibles did not preserve this, what I consider to be a superstitious uh, tradition. Not all English Bibles do, by the way. Uh, some English Bibles translate some instances of the covenant name of God uh, with the covenant name. The uh, Christian Standard Bible, for instance, will use Yahweh in certain places, although they do so inconsistently. They don't use it in all of the places where that name occurs. The 1901 American Standard Version used Jehovah consistently. I don't think there's any place that they omitted uh, putting Jehovah in place of the covenant name of God. So that could be, those could be helpful resources, but if you just simply pay attention to capitalization in your Bible, uh, you won't have any difficulty recognizing what this is, and that is why uh, you know, curiously to, to some people, uh, I read Yahweh when we're reading the Old Testament. Now, you may notice, that, Pastor, you didn't read Yahweh as you were reading it here in Mark chapter 12, even though that is the way that it's printed on the page. But the problem is Mark chapter 12 is written in Greek. And in Greek, it's not the word Yahweh. It's simply the Greek word for Lord. And so you have to know what passage is being translated. You have to know what passage is being referenced to be able to even understand this issue. That's the linguistic issue that you have to be aware of. 
that in Psalm 110, what the text actually says is, Yahweh, the true God, said to my Lord, who is David's Lord, it's the Messiah. Yahweh said to the Messiah, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Secondly, we said there's a theological issue. The Jews rightly understood Psalm 110 as a messianic psalm and arguably one of the most important, if not the most important, of the messianic psalm. And Jewish interpreters all agreed rightly that when David says, my Lord, he's talking about the Messiah. He's talking about his descendant who would eventually sit on his throne. And if you don't appreciate that messianic context, this question isn't going to make any sense to you. The third issue we said was cultural. The Jews always viewed one's ancestors as superior to their descendants. Now, that does not mean that they did not recognize that a descendant might excel in terms of specific accomplishments. I mean, you think about Hannah has a son named Samuel, who is the last of the judges, the first of the classical prophets, and is a great man. I mean, just a tremendous figure in redemptive history. What did Hannah ever accomplish compared to her son? And yet, Hannah and her husband Elkanah, as ancestors of Samuel, would be greater. Elkanah, Samuel's father, would be greater than his son. Because this is a, this is a view uh, in terms of descendancy, not in, in view of accomplishments. And so the Messiah was David's descendant. And yet in Psalm 110, David refers to his descendant as his master. And Jesus' question is, how can that be? How can that be? Evidently, the Jewish leaders were unable to answer the question. And evidently, verse 37, the common people loved that. <laughs> they listened to this gladly. I don't know if they appreciate the fact that the scribes are stumped or if they just love the fact that Jesus is able to come up with questions that, they're, that, that his enemies cannot answer and every question that they pose to him, he's able to answer. I don't know what it is that delights them so much about this exchange, but clearly they hear him gladly. But why couldn't the leaders answer this question? It is a simple, straightforward Bible question. It's because of their theological framework and their presuppositions. And we have said this many times since chapter 8, and I will underline it here again, the danger of unexamined assumptions is that you will not see what Scripture is teaching. I've been guilty of that. For so many, time, so many times in my life, I grew up in a tradition where we denied the gospel because we never examined our fundamental presuppositions. I was certain I would never be a Calvinist because I never examined the assumptions that I thought ruled it out. And if you do not examine those things, you'll read the Bible and it'll remain a mystery. You may think that you understand what it's saying, but you won't. We have to ask the question, what am I taking for granted? We have to be, be able to, to look at those foundational assumptions. That doesn't mean that all truth is up for grabs. That doesn't mean that every time you open your Bible, you say, well, maybe today I'm going to learn that there is not a God, or that he's not triune, or that the Bible is not God's word. No, we can establish that the Bible clearly teaches these things, but the point is you can't simply take for granted all of the things that you think are true, or you come to the passage and you don't ask the question that it is intended to answer. Now, we are able to answer Jesus' question, not because we're smarter than the scribes, but because of the fuller revelation of Christ that is recorded in the New Testament scriptures. The truth is, this is a Bible question that could only be answered after the resurrection. Jesus is both God and man. He is one person with two natures, and that is something that the Jews did not expect. They never even considered the possibility. Had they considered the possibility, they would have considered it blasphemous. This would be like a Greek notion of the gods. It would not be considered orthodox in any way. But because we know that this is in fact the case... Well, then we can understand how Jesus can be both David's descendant and David's Lord. Because he comes from David, according to the flesh, but he precedes David according to his divine nature. And yet he's one person. He's not two people. 
He's one person with two natures. David's son and yet David's Lord, even as we confess and as we sing. The Jews did not expect the Messiah to be divine. But once you know that Jesus is the God-man, this passage is no longer puzzling. It makes perfect sense. Of course, David's son can be his Lord because David's son is David's creator. That's a paradox. Granted that that's a paradox. It's not a contradiction, but it's a paradox created by what we call the hypostatic union. The union of two natures in one person, that being Jesus, our Savior, Emmanuel. Now, what you see here then, very fascinatingly, is that Scripture forms our systematic theology, but then systematic theology helps us rightly interpret Scripture. There is this symbiotic relationship between the two. Now, you understand, when we talk about systematic theology, we're talking about synthesizing the doctrines that the Bible teaches. That's what the Westminster Confession of Faith is. It's just a summary of what Scripture teaches, not just in one passage, but throughout all passages, across the entire canon. What does the Bible teach us about God? What does the Bible teach us about man? What does the Bible teach us about sin? What does the Bible teach us about justification and sanctification in the church? And the the last things, we can synthesize and summarize all of that information, looking at all of Scripture. It has to come from Scripture. We don't write a systematic theology book and then decide that that's the lens through which we read the Bible. No, we read the Bible and it tells us what our theology ought to be. And we synthesize that and we summarize that and we put that all together. But then as we've put it together, now suddenly we understand the framework. The framework of truth. The framework of doctrine. And we know that God is not going to contradict himself anywhere. God is true. He is without error. And his word carries that same character. And so as I'm reading the Bible in one place, I may be struggling with an exegetical question like this, and yet as I reflect upon what the totality of Scripture has taught me about the Messiah, I'm able to say, aha, of course the Messiah is David's son, because he's descended from David according to the flesh. But of course the Messiah is David's Lord, Because the Messiah is also divine, in fact, the creator, and therefore he precedes David and all things that are not God. Systematic theology helps us interpret Scripture. But first you have to examine your assumptions, and that's what these scribes had never done. Now, by way of application, before we close this part, we can connect the prophetic dots by understanding, at least in our fallible way, the two natures of Christ. I honestly, as I was putting this together, I was thinking I would really like to just like spend, I don't know, maybe, maybe this is what we'll do in December. Maybe I will change our plans for the Advent season that we don't refer to as the Advent season. Because we always talk about the incarnation in some way, shape, or form. I don't know, maybe. I, this is just coming to me right now. I shouldn't be thinking out loud. <laughs> Suffice it to say, there are many prophetic texts that can only be properly and fully understood after Jesus' resurrection. A lot of them. And you could take time and go through multiple ones of them and say, oh, this is so plain now. And it would have made any sense to me before. If I was reading this in Malachi's day, I would have no idea what he's talking about. Even if I knew he was talking about the Messiah, I would not properly. I mean, let's face it. Jesus has told the disciples three times explicitly and mentioned it implicitly on the way down the Mount of Transfiguration. We're going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be killed. And then I'm going to rise the third day. And when it happens, none of them see it coming. Like, who knew? You can connect the prophetic text. You can connect the dots that the prophets are drawing on the page with an understanding of the incarnation of the Son of God. The Old Testament plainly announces the most glorious truths about the incarnation of God's Son, but that truth remains hidden. It is not understood until after the Lord's glorification and after the descent of the Spirit. We read the Old Testament, we say, how could the Jews ever miss this? But you would have missed it too. All of us would have, and all of us still would without the gift of the Holy Spirit without the blessing of regeneration, without the illumination of God's grace. We're able to see Old Testament prophecy far more clearly after its fulfillment than God's people ever could before it. 
And that's, that's very important, and so maybe that's an idea that we will develop at a later point in time. Now, I've got about five minutes on the clock in the back, and I'm not going to try and tackle two passages, two remaining units of text, but let me close this with this idea. Uh, first, an encouragement, and then an anticipation. First is the encouragement. The last two stories in Mark chapter 12 are very brief, and probably, at least one of them, very familiar and they have a very important connection between the two of them that is almost always overlooked. So let me encourage you to read those two units of text, those brief verses at the end of chapter 12, and try to read them in context. Try to remember everything that we've seen from the beginning of chapter 11 up until now, the end of chapter 12, and try to think about what the connection might be between these two episodes that are set side by side in both Mark and Luke's gospel. That's your encouragement. Now, the second thing I want to say before we close is an anticipation. We've said that from the beginning of chapter 11 all the way through chapter 12, there has been building a case against the temple, against Jerusalem. Every unit, in one way or another, has anticipated the judgment that God is going to bring upon the Jewish system. And we are going to see the prophecy of that, the pronouncement of that, by the judge, Jesus himself, in Mark chapter 13. But I want you to already begin connecting those dots I want you to realize that in the triumphal entry, the glory of God is coming into Jerusalem for the first time since the glory departed in Ezekiel and Jeremiah's day back in 586 B.C. I want you to see that when Jesus curses the fig tree, he is showing us symbolically what he has come into the city and into that temple to do. I want you to see that when Jesus comes to the temple and describes it as a den of thieves and then purges it of its evil, that is exactly the purpose of the judgment that he is about to pour out upon that house. And then I want you to see that as we go through all of these confrontations with the religious leaders, the sincerity of this last scribe notwithstanding, the religious leadership of, Jesus, uh, of the Jews at this time is shown to be completely corrupt. The chief priests, the scribes, the elders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they are corrupt. The common people are glad when they are exposed. All of that is leading us up to this final section in chapter 12 where their corruption will be most fully displayed and then judgment will be pronounced. And my intention is not to take as much time in chapter 13 as I would like to take, but nonetheless uh, to take two or three weeks to go through that chapter, to walk through it with you. Because I really do believe that Mark chapter 13, which by the way is the parallel to Matthew chapter 24, Luke chapter 21, and an earlier discourse by Jesus at the end of Luke chapter 17. It's called the Olivet Discourse. I really believe that Mark 13 and Luke 21 are much easier to understand in context than Matthew 24 is. I think it's because we have our defenses up in Matthew 24. We know what Matthew 24 is about. The only problem is that what we think we know about Matthew 24 happens to be wrong. We come to Mark chapter 13 and Luke chapter 21 and we say, I don't remember this chapter. I, I'm, not, I'm not as prepared to assume that I know what's going on here. And there are also some contextual clues that I think make those two chapters a little bit easier to interpret in context. So I do want to spend just a little bit of extra time in that chapter uh, trying to unpack that with you. But that will have to wait until next week because now we are out of time. So let's bow together and close in prayer. Gracious God and Father, thank you for the way in which your Son answered with wisdom, with grace, with truth, all of the challenges, all of the questions, all of the potential critiques that were made of him. We're thankful, O oh Lord, for this remarkable example of confidence in you as his father, a confidence with your word and its truth and compassion for your people that were being led astray by a corrupt and abusive 
uh, religious uh, administration. We pray, O oh Father, that we would not only appreciate these virtues in our Savior, but that we would desire and pray that your Spirit would form much the same within us all, that we also, O oh Lord, would have confidence in you, that we would have confidence in your word, that we would have compassion for those who are made in your image, that we, O oh Lord, would love you, not as we have, not as we do, but rather as we should, with all our heart and all our soul and all our strength and all our mind, and that you would help us then as an expression of loving you to love our neighbor, your image bearers around us, uh, even as ourselves. Please watch over us as we return to our homes this evening. Please be merciful to us, forgive our sins, strengthen us in the ways of righteousness, help us, O Lord, in our duty, make us a blessing to others, and then save us with you, we pray in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen.